All right, good morning, uh, everyone. I know uh, we still have about two minutes, but uh, quickly remind everybody, because I forgot, uh, to turn your phones off or put them on vibrate. Hope everyone slept well last night. All right, I see uh, down back we're all ready, so excellent. Uh, I'd like to uh, call the Law Amendments Committee for Thursday, October the 20th to order and welcome our everyone here to Province House. Uh, my name's Brad Johns, I'm the MLA for the constituency of Sackville Uniac as well as Minister of Justice and Attorney General and I'll be uh, chairing today's meeting. I will uh, ask the members of the committee to uh, identify themselves for the record before we get started, and we'll start uh, with the government side. Hi, I'm uh, Chris Palmer, MLA for Kings West. Nice to see everybody. Good morning, everyone. Trevor Boudreau, MLA for Richmond. Good morning, I'm John White, MLA for Glace Bay Dominion. Good morning, everyone. Dave Ritzy, MLA for Truro, Bible Hill, Millbrook, and Salmon River. Good morning, Ronnie LeBlanc, MLA for Clare. Morning, everyone. Keith Irving, MLA King South. Hi, Gary Burrell, Halifax, Chibucto. Lisa Lachance, Halifax, Little Sable Island. Thank you, members. And uh, I'd also like to identify for the record Ledge Council, who's with us today. We have Gordon Hebb and Killen Schimler. Um, just before we get things underway, I'd like to run down a few of the uh, rules for the committee. I uh, remind everyone to please turn off your cell phones or put them on vibrate. I will remind everyone who is attending or who is in the audience to please be respectful of all times. There's to be no shouting cheering either for or against anything that's discussed and we ask for uh, everyone to please behave during uh, presentations. Uh, taking of pictures or videos by anyone other than the media is not permitted. I would remind presenters that there are not to be any props used during presentations. If presenters do have handouts for the committee members, if they could please provide them to the page by the door who will uh, distribute them to committee members. Uh, copies of all written submissions on the bill have been received by email up to the time the bill is reported back to the House or in person during LAC meeting. will be given to the library staff to be posted online. Submissions received after the bill has been reported back to the House are distributed electronically to uh, Law Amendment Committee members but are not posted online. All presenters today are required to prove or provide notification to Ledge Office that they intended on speaking. So we do have a approved speakers list and we will move forward with that list today. The agenda listing the order in which presenters will be invited to speak is available for viewing on the corner table when you come in the door just to the left of uh, MLA Palmer. 
When your name is called, please come forward, state your name, uh, how you would like to be addressed or referred to by the committee, and any organizations, if any, that you represent. Presentation time. If there are eight or less speakers signed up to a particular bill, each presenter will be allowed 10 minutes to address the committee. However, if there are only if there are eight or more on a particular bill, each presenter has five minutes to address the committee. I will alert a presenter when they have one minute left for presentations. There will be up to five minutes allowed after a presentation for questions from committee members. Once a speaker has concluded their presentation, I'd ask that they please leave the room in order to allow other speakers who may be waiting to come in and have a seat for their turn. Everybody okay? MLA Irving. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. I just a uh, quick question with respect to the rules that you just outlined. Uh, I have not been at this committee for uh, a bit of time, uh, but I'm wondering if those rules have been uh, considered by the committee and approved by the committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Irving. They're the rules we've been following since uh, the very beginning of the committee, and I have them written down. I read them the same at every meeting, so, yep. And uh, for clarification, those are also uh, the way that the committee works is at the, uh, you know, you chaired the committee previously, and it's at uh, the discretion of the chair. We set those rules down in the very beginning so that uh, it would be very clear to everybody how we operate, so. Thank you. Any further questions, committee? Are we all set? Um, so we'll move on. Uh, we'll begin with uh, any of the bills that we don't have uh, any pre uh, presenters registered for. Um, and then we'll move into the presentations. So our first bill, uh, bill number 196, the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia. Um, we do not have any uh, representation who notified Ledge Council on this one, so I would look to committee members for a motion on this. Uh, MLA Ritzy. Uh, I move that uh, Bill 196, Art Gallery, Nova Scotia Act, as amended, be reported back to the House without amendments. Motion on the floor. All those in favor, signify with aye. Nay. Anyone nay? Excellent, thank you. Uh, moving on now to our next bill. Oh, sorry. So that bill is carried. Uh, or that motion, I'm sorry, is carried. So move on now to our second bill, bill number 200, Nova Scotia Museum Act amended. No representation here. Look uh, for a motion of committee. MLA Boudreau. Thank you, Chair. I move that bill to number 200, Nova Scotia Museum Act, be reported back to the House without further amendment. Thank you. All those in favor, signify aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. Thank you. That bill is carried, and we'll refer that back to the House. That motion. Uh, moving on now to bill number 204, Municipal Government Act and the Halifax Regional Municipal Charter. We do have uh, two speakers who've uh, requested uh, through Ledge Council to speak today. And uh, so our first presenter would be Ross Jefferson. Well, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, good morning, members, honorable members of uh, the council. Uh, I'd also like to recognize uh, His Worship uh, uh, Mayor Savage, uh, and I'd also like to recognize, before I start, uh, uh, Councillor Hensby. I believe that Councillor Hensby was the uh, member who brought forward the original uh, legislation back in 2001 with respect to the uh, Halifax Marketing Levy Act. So uh, thank you very much uh, this morning for your time. Um, my name is Ross Jefferson. I am the president and CEO of Discover Halifax. I'm here to speak in favor of the proposed legislation and to answer any questions 
about the current services provided by the hotel levy and or any intentions for improved services based on uh, the, the proposed changes. Um, we do have a package uh, today. Um, I'm going to just uh, touch on the highlights. This is more for a takeaway for you. Um, but I should start off just by uh, perhaps explaining who Discover Halifax is. We are the nonprofit membership based organization uh, that provides tourism development, tourism promotion services for the entire HRM region. We are membership based, we have over 600 members spread throughout all of HRM. We were created in 2002. Uh, and our founding members were the Hotel uh, Association of Nova Scotia and the Halifax Regional Municipality. We are Council's official tourism marketing agency and we are primarily funded by the hotel tax levied on stays in HRM. Our mission is to maximize economic and social benefits derived from the global tourism industry and to benefit the people who live, who visit and who invest in the region. Um, tourism uh, obviously is incredibly important uh, here in Atlantic Canada, very much so here in Nova Scotia and here in HRM. Uh, in an average year, we'll have about 5.3 million overnight stays here in HRM. Those people will spend about $1.3 billion on a variety of services and goods. The industry here in HRM supports over 4,000 businesses and 34,000 jobs. It benefits all citizens, not only from tax generation, in particular about $90 million in HST collected from, H, uh, from within the HRM region, but it also, when done well, tourism provides cultural and social benefits to all citizens. Just a little background on the hotel levy, and I know the committee uh, is likely aware, but in 2002, the Halifax Regional Municipality Marketing Act was enacted. This enabled the creation of our organization and additionally funded support for major events and festivals in the HRM region. Today, 40% of the total tax uh, collected here in HRM supports a granting program for major events, festivals, and sporting events, and the other 60% supports the services of Discover Halifax. It should be noted that both programs often partner with the province of Nova Scotia for the attraction of events, marketing, and promotion of the province as well as HRM. When first created, in the, uh, in HRM in Nova Scotia was truly a leader in the country with respect to this type of tax and the creation of an independent uh, destination management organization. Since this time, however, the competitive environment has grown immensely with all of Canada's major destinations catching up and now exceeding uh, this region for investment from hotel taxes into tourism marketing and promotion. Hotel taxes have now become commonplace. As you can see on your page four, Halifax is now the lowest tax in the country, with Ontario now introducing legislation this last year at 4% and New Brunswick at 3.5%. On a per room basis, also illustrated in your package, you can see to try and uh, have a comparative basis the per hotel room investment uh, shows that the average investment by competitive destinations is 2.5 times greater than in HRM. Further to this, those funds are often leveraged against institutions like Destination Canada and other agencies like the regional development authorities to again further develop and promote their industries. And finally, uh, no surprise uh, to this committee, but when you look at the geography and the responsibility within HRM, we are the size of PEI and we have a mandate to serve the entirety of HRM, which provides additional challenges to our organization and to the grant fund. To counter this and in recognition of the importance of the tourism region, HRM Council and the Hotel Association have been working diligently on an agreement to request amendments to the legislation to allow the increase and HRM Council have agreed to also increase their investment matching up to one million dollars of the new proceeds from this legislation. I'd like to share with you what the levy currently funds today and what we're thinking about or planning for with the uh, eventual and hopeful uh, increase in the hotel tax. First, our destination marketing program. Uh, this promotes the region to leisure visitors in priority markets. We use this in typical things like television commercials, 
uh, digital pre-roll, videos that you'd see before seeing a movie. Now you might not see it in Nova Scotia because we're not advertising in Nova Scotia, but we are advertising in our, one of our key priority markets. Today, because of funding challenges, we're only able to market to Atlantic Canadians. It is what we call our drive market. It is our biggest market. But we have a massive opportunity to market to other Canadians, as well as select international markets of the benefits of traveling here to Nova Scotia and traveling to HRM. We develop inspiring content. We work with travel media professionals. But we are seeking the increased investment to also support select Canadian and international markets. This will help access uh, uh, demand to generate uh, air access demand, support new route development, and overall support one of our largest markets. In our visitor experience program today, funding supports everything from the development of visitor guides and maps and services to promote our existing businesses to visitors who are traveling here to our region. It's an incredible service that used, that's used by uh, over 1.5 million visitors every year, everything from maps uh, and uh, information about things to do in our region. In our conventions and sales program, you should be aware that over 50% of conventions and meetings happen in convention hotels outside of our convention center. But a significant portion, the remaining 50%, do happen in our convention center. Through our systems and through our processes, about 60 or so sales agents promote and sell the Halifax region as a key destination for major conferences and events. The system is uh, actually quite complicated. I, I won't uh, bore you with the technology, but suffice to say that we will bid on around 200 events a year, upwards of 120,000 rooms across uh, 12 different hotels bidding on events and trying to keep the prices and the holds available. We do that through the technology that's available through the DMO. In our events program, I've, event, I've mentioned earlier that 40% of the levy today supports grants for major events, sports, and events, and that amounts to about $1.7 million a year. With this increase uh, from 2% to 3%, we will be increasing the investment amount to many events who are not supported today, and we are looking to uh, create a coordinated team to implement a strategic plan across all of the parties involved in this initiative. And finally, we're seeking to expand our services beyond just marketing and promotion to focus on the supply side issues of tourism development today. We know today marketing and promotion is one part, but the challenges today are around workforce development, labor, and just as an example, the two years of coming through the pandemic, that was all about coordination and management of things beyond just demand promotion. Destination development is the coordinated management of all elements to make up the destination ranging from policy, investment, to sustainability, and it includes the consideration not only of economic, but social and environmental factors that arise from a growing tourism industry. The process brings together stakeholders in a collective impact model with the common goal of developing well-managed and sustainable visitor destination. This will directly support the implementation of the Halifax Integrated Regional Tourism Master Plan, work that we uh, uh, revealed uh, one year ago, and we're very uh, excited about getting to work on this plan. In closing, we know that visitors don't just come to one, one region. When they come, they travel across political boundaries. Uh, this is true very much in Nova Scotia, and today we have a very strong cooperative re relationship with our other four DMOs here in Nova Scotia. One minute. In addition to the expansion of the services that we're planning, we are very encouraged about the possibility of this network expanding. I just came back from Winnipeg uh, uh, last evening, the evening before, uh, where all of the destination marketing organizations across the country are meeting with Destination Canada. And I can say it's lonely uh, being the only DMO in Nova Scotia that's uh, at that table. Uh, I'm really looking forward to what this can do for Nova Scotia as a whole, what it can do for HRM, and I thank the committee for uh, listening to us this morning. This legislation brings us one step closer to uh, remaining <coughs> and becoming uh, competitive again in, uh, against all of our destinations in Canada, and I want to thank the committee for the time this morning. Thank you very much for your comments, sir. I'll go, uh, are there any questions of our speaker from members? Uh, MLA Boudreau. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for your presentation. And um, 
you talked about some of the other DMOs in the province, and certainly I've spoken to Destination Cape Breton and Terry and that crew over there. And um, certainly my understanding from them is they're certainly very supportive of this legislation as well. And you briefly mentioned you're encouraged by the opportunity for others to kind of take a look at this as well. Can you speak to that? I mean, I, I understand that there's other areas of the province that are very interested in what this can provide and how this could be um, not just for HRM and, and Cape Breton, but also for other destinations in Nova Scotia. So maybe you could uh, speak a little bit on that. I'm sorry. I didn't recognize you, so I don't think they turned your microphone on. <laughs> I, d I don't see the light on, so uh, I'll go to uh, Mr. Jefferson, please. Thank Here, you. I'm sorry. I apologize. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and through you um, to the member. Uh, yes, the, the cooperation uh, between all of our uh, DMOs here, the four uh, in Nova Scotia, is critically important. Uh, work very closely with, uh, with Terry uh, in Cape Breton, with Cindy in Deans, and with, uh, with Neil uh, in Yarmouth. And uh, again, just to repeat, uh, that the visitors don't stay in one destination, they travel uh, as, across all of these political boundaries. And again, just to repeat, uh, that uh, convention business uh, here in Halifax, we know that 50% of the visitors coming for a convention stay in pre-post, uh, and they travel uh, beyond. They, they actually, get, this is their opportunity to see Nova Scotia, and we encourage that. So the cooperation and the opportunity for the growth of this network, we, we have worked with uh, many of the, the municipalities that are looking uh, to bring this legislation forward to support them. And what I will say in particular that I think is, is very good about this legislation is it does not pr prescribe a specific model. It actually allows each region to develop a strategy that makes most sense for them, as well as a partnerships with the communities that make sense. And I know uh, in Cape Breton, those partnerships uh, between the other municipalities are critical. So thank you for the question. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions of speaker? I'll go to Emily Nicole, please. Good morning, Ross. Nice to see you. It's nice to see you at yet another board table as I served on when it used to be Destination Halifax. So there's been many evolutions in tourism in Nova Scotia since then, and it's, it's a good thing. And I want to thank you for your work in that regard. So you just mentioned about, you know, there's going to be each region's going to have their strategy and has, we know, the, the hotel associations had a much input into this solution. And I just wanted to know, the revenue received, how will that be shared among others in the province as we promote tourism across this great province? Uh, I'll uh, recognize the speaker, please. Thank you. Thank you again, uh, Chair, through you to, uh, uh, to the member. Um, yes, uh, as, as, as we understand the legislation, this will allow all, all regions uh, with, within uh, Nova Scotia to, uh, to look at establishing a model that makes sense for them based on the revenues that are collected uh, within their jurisdictions. I am happy to speak to HRM. Uh, I shared uh, during my presentation that uh, one of the challenges we have is having a land mass and a responsibility of what was formerly 210 communities. Uh, uh, that uh, our mandate is to serve the entirety of HRM. Uh, so this, uh, in particular, um, we've got an agreement from our hotel association, um, moral support, to uh, undertake this. I, I have to share one key point, is that um, the relationship between our hotel association and our municipality here is incredibly unique. Uh, it is not a, usually a favorable or uh, amenable relationship across the country. It is incredibly unique here. They support, as does obviously council, uh, our mandate uh, to serve all of HRM, and so this funding will, uh, will absolutely help us uh, with that effort. 
Okay, that uh, concludes your time. I gave you a few extra minutes too, so thank you. And uh, I will, uh, before you go, I'll say as a uh, past member of Destination Halifax and uh, chair of HRM Special Event Advisory uh, for about five years, I certainly uh, appreciate you coming today and presenting. And uh, I know firsthand all the benefits that it's done for, for HRM. So hopefully the legislation will do the same thing for the rest of the province. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, we'll move right on now to our next speaker, um, and that would be uh, the mayor of the Halifax Regional Municipality, Mr. Michael Savage. Good morning, Mayor. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Nice to see you, uh, nice to see you. again. Yes. Nice job on Sunday at the see Fall you, of Peace See you offices. a lot lately. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> see you more now than I did when I was on council. <laughs> no comment. Um, uh, so ju just to... Uh, to remind you, uh, Mayor, that we have uh, 10 minutes for presentation and then five minute follow up from the committee members. And uh, I, I assume everybody can just address you as Mayor. They can call me whatever they want. Okay. And with that, you can, you can start. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Chair and uh, Honorable uh, Members. I first want to acknowledge that we're here in Mi'kma'ki, the traditional, the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. And uh, we honor the peace and friendship treaties that were signed many years ago. Uh, if it's appropriate, could I ask uh, my assistant to pass out copies of my presentation? Is that an appropriate thing to do at this point? Okay, I'll ask uh, Yes, it, the uh, Connor will hand them out for okay. you. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, back before law amendments, and I want to support this bill, which will allow the Halifax region to leverage new dollars uh, to further invest in a tourism industry that today results in about $1.3 billion in annual spending in HRM. This legislation puts Canada, uh, Nova Scotia closer to a level playing field with other Canadian jurisdictions when it comes to tourism marketing and development. For example, New Brunswick recently announced legislation to support a hotel levy of 3.5%. Ontario is at 4 While rates vary across the country, the range is usually from 3 to 8%. HRM supports the increase to the cap on the market levy. In fact, Council has requested that the levy cap be removed altogether. This would provide us with the flexibility needed to work with our industry partners to determine appropriate funding levels to respond to developments in the tourism sector and remain competitive with other jurisdictions. HRM likewise welcomes the amendment enabling the levy to be applied to operations consisting of less than 20 rooms. Short-term rentals are playing an increasingly large role in the tourism accommodation sector. The ability to apply the levy to these operations will help ensure a more level playing field between traditional hotels and short-term rental operations while also providing greater support for destination marketing and development opportunities. Tourism dollars spent in the province benefit everybody, not just the businesses on the front lines, but residents and communities as well. It supports rural, urban, suburban parts of HRM improving the lot for many small to mid-sized businesses. The need to increase the levy is one of those instances where there seems to be a lot of agreement between the city and province, destination Halifax, and the Hotel Association. HRM and the Hotel Association of Nova Scotia, HANS, entered into an MOU in 2022 to support an increase to the current marketing levy. The Hotel Association has agreed to support the lifting of the 2% cap, and the municipality has agreed to increase our investment. An increased levy will make us more competitive in marketing our region and allow marketing and tourism investment so that we can realize the potential of the expanding tourism sector and enhance our competitive position relative to other Canadian jurisdictions. Consider that the average investment by our Canadian competitors is right now more than two and a half times greater than an HRM. And unlike many of its urban competitors, Destination Halifax is mandated to a geographic area, as Ross indicated, the size of Prince Edward Island. We continue to benefit from municipal contributions that make up 11% of the revenue of Discover Halifax. It has received no provincial funding since it was cancelled in 2016. This combined with the lower levy means Halifax is now in last place among its competitors for a per hotel room marketing investment. The work that can be undertaken with additional revenues from an increased levy to draw more people into the region pays dividends to provincial and municipal coffers. Indeed, the business case prepared by HRM 
the Hotel Association, and Destination Halifax found a modest 2.5% increase in visitation would generate over $265 million annually in new revenues to the tourism industry, over a million in new sales tax and over one million in property tax. Tourism supports all communities through economic contributions of taxes created by payroll and sales tax, but also tourism infrastructure, amenities, and community programming. It's often used by and created for the benefit of both visitors and residents. There's been broad consultation on changes undertaken with this work, which reinforces the vision of the Integrated Tourism Master Plan to support and grow our local tourism industry and by extension support our diverse economy. I want to thank Ross who just presented for the great leadership that his association has bought to tourism in this region. They support all of HRM and they've undertaken some significant studies as part of the master plan looking at things like over tourism and the impact not only on visitors but on the entire community. I want to thank the hotel association, people like Megan Delaney, David Clark, Jeff Ransom and others and I know that Megan would have been here today if she was able to in support of this. I also want to acknowledge my colleague David Hensby uh, who's here with me. It's a unique opportunity to be able to speak and not be rebutted by uh, Councillor Hensby. Uh, but in this one, as in many things, we are in total agreement on this issue. This legislation will further allow us to promote the Halifax region as a destination of choice for leisure and business travelers and build a better Halifax experience not just for tourists, but for everybody. Thank you, uh, merci à tous, Wallalia. Thank you very much uh, for your presentations, Your Worship, and I'll ask uh, if there are any questions from members of committee, and I'll start with MLA Lachant, please. Thank you so much for being here today and speaking in support of this increased levy and, and the changes to the Act. Um, I'm wondering, you talked about short-term rentals and, you know, evening out the playing field amongst uh, those in, in regular hotels. Um, has have folks at HRM, have you given thought to how you're going to um, undertake that new levy action without a registry of, a of Airbnbs, for instance? I'll uh, recognize the uh, speaker, please. I can't speak to the mechanism. I, I think we can get that answer to you in terms of the mechanism that's involved. As you know, short-term rentals uh, also have an impact on the housing market in, uh, in, in Halifax. And I think, at the very least, it makes sense that there be some levy. They benefit from the tourism destination marketing that uh, takes place. Uh, so in terms of the actual mechanism, I think we can get that information to you to the extent that it exists now. Uh, but the principle is something that's been used in other jurisdictions. Uh, and I want to just say, you know, this is a bit, bit of a unique proposition, is you've got private businesses coming to city and province and saying, we will undertake to put this tax on our properties. Businesses don't like taxes uh, in a lot of cases, but they recognize that the benefit that this brings, not only to their business, but ultimately to the whole community, uh, is worth that investment. So when they come to us and we've been talking to them, Ross, I'm thinking we've been talking about this for five years. Um, in terms of bringing this to Council for recommendation and ultimately for this legislation as uh, I guess both uh, Minister Johns and MLA Nickel have been on the, uh, the board of Destination Halifax. So um, I applaud the Hotel Association for their recognition of this issue and the leadership that they've shown. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Your Worship. Thank you for the time this morning. All right, I would uh, look for a motion to uh, present, uh, presentations on Bill 204, Municipal Government Act, Halifax Regional Municipal Charter, be now concluded. Uh, MLA Ritzy. <clears throat> I move that uh, Bill 204, Municipal Government Act, and Halifax Regional Municipality Charter amended be reported back to the House without amendments. Uh, can I have a quick uh, motion to close the... Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so moved by uh, MLA Ritzy that uh, presentations on Bill 203, or I'm sorry, 204 now conclude. Uh, all those in favor? Okay. 
Um, and I'll go to uh, MLA Ritzy now for a second motion. Thank you. My apologies, Mr. Chair. I move that uh, Bill Number 204, Municipal Government Act, and Halifax Regional Municipality Charter, as amended, be reported back to the House without further amendments. Uh, all those in favor, signify aye. aye. Opposed. Thank you, everyone. And we'll move on now to our next bill. Um, I would po uh, point out for committee members that uh, we will have one presenter that will present now at 9.30, and then we will have another presenter that will present at 11 on this. So we'll go to our first presenter on Bill 207, the Electricity Act, uh, Brianna Walsh. Good morning. Once again, you have uh, 10 minutes to present to the committee and five minutes follow up for our questions from committee members. If you could just identify uh, any organizations that you represent and how you would like to be identified by committee members, please. And I'll turn things over to speaker. Yes, thank you. It's Brenna Walsh. Um, I am representing the Ecology Action Center this morning and being referred to by committee as Ms. Walsh would be um, my preference. All right, wonderful. Thank you, Ms. Walsh. Walsh, and we'll uh, start your time now. Thank you. I acknowledge that we are gathered here today on the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Mi'kmaq people, past, present, and future caretakers of this land. I am Dr. Brenna Walsh, Energy Coordinator at the Ecology Action Center, and I was born and raised in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. I have a doctorate in physical chemistry and have spent my career working to shape energy and climate policy across municipal, provincial, and federal levels of government. Today, I will be speaking to some of our concerns regarding the Act to Amend Chapter 25 of the Acts of 2004, the Electricity Act Respecting the Hydrogen Innovation Program, which I will hereby refer to as the Electricity Act Amendment. First issue I want to raise is relating to the parameters in which hydrogen is discussed within this bill. I would like to reference two places where the bill has been discussed by the government of Nova Scotia and link these references to the context in which hydrogen is discussed within the bill. The Electricity Act Amendment refers to hydrogen 25 times. However, the word green is listed in the amendment a single time within the word greenhouse gases in the amendment to chapter 25, section 4FA, parentheses 4E. However, in the press release published accompanying Bill 207 and Bill 206, upon first reading on October 17, 2002, green hydrogen is mentioned seven times, and in the introduction of the bill by Minister Rushton during his second reading on October 18, 2002, four times. In both cases, more than half the instances hydrogen is mentioned. Is it referred to as green hydrogen? Though it is encouraging to see the intentions of this government to consider green hydrogen production, we are concerned that this amendment, as written, would open a pathway for other flavors of hydrogen production as they, as they have come to be known. Opening up potential for development of gray hydrogen, that which is produced by burning natural gas, or blue hydrogen, produced the same way, but with the promise of CO2 emissions being abated by expensive and unproven carbon capture and storage technologies, is counter to meeting the province's emission reduction goals stated within the Environmental Goals and Climate Change Reduction Act of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 53% below 2005 levels by 2030 and reaching net zero emissions by 2050. We would urge the government to reconsider the framing of hydrogen within this amendment and restrict the definition of a hydrogen facility currently defined within the amendment as, and I quote, a facility that produces or processes hydrogen, end quote, which would be included within the list of wholesale consumers to only those producing green hydrogen from renewable resources. We propose the definition of a hydrogen facility be therefore modified to mean, quote, a facility that produces green hydrogen or processes hydrogen which was produced using renewable technology, end quote. Our second point is con of concern is the creation and development of the associated regulations governing the hydrogen innovation program. The amendment states that the governor and council, which from our understanding is, indicates the premier and his cabinet 
quote, may take regulations respecting any aspect of the hydrogen innovation program, end quote, and includes a long list, A to L, of 12 areas where the Premier uh, and his cabinet and, count, and council will make decisions on the structure, eligibility requirements of a hydrogen facility connecting to the grid, performance standards, evaluation of carbon intensity of, hydrogen of a hydrogen facility, whether the hydrogen produced or processed be used within the province, and other parameters within the application process, which we expect would include provisions around siting of a hydrogen facility. Though we commend the government in developing a long list of considerations in which the governor and council will be considering and development of this program, we are deeply troubled by the amount of power this will give a small amount of decision makers in terms of developing how hydrogen will be produced and used within our province. Nowhere in this amendment is there inclusion or consideration of important actors, such as indigenous landholders and rights holders, local communities in which hydrogen production and processing facilities will be built, or experts who could provide advice on appropriate land use and impacts of a hydrogen facility on sensitive ecosystems or species. As presented, the governor and council will have sweeping authority to establish regulations which will shape the emerging industry in the province of Nova Scotia, and with no guaranteed input from the public or other stakeholders, which will be essential to develop a just and effective strategy for production and use of hydrogen within the province. Additionally, in relating back to my first point, there are no accountability mechanisms within this amendment that ensure the hydrogen facilities approved within the regulations would be producing green hydrogen and providing hydrogen to Nova Scotia for sectors where it would effectively support decarbonization, particularly in hard to abate sectors, as well as for storage to provide stability to our decarbonizing grid. In summary, our concern with the Electricity Act amendment are centered around two critical aspects. One, the fact that this amendment leaves open the possibility for development of carbon intensive gray hydrogen as well as blue hydrogen, whose claims of low carbon intensity, intensity at scale are unproven, instead of limiting inclusion as wholesale consumers to facilities that produce and process green hydrogen. Second, a seemingly closed door process to develop regulations around the hydrogen, around the hydrogen industry in Nova Scotia are concerning. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. I will ask members of the committee if there are any questions. Uh, MLA Lachance, please. Hi, thanks so much for coming this morning. Um, you talked about um, the, you described it as a closed door process and a very limited um, accountability structure. Um, what, what other provinces have this in place and, and how do they manage the, the decision making around it? I recognize uh, the presenter, please. Through the chair to the council, to the speaker. Um, I'm not sure that I, I know it's any specific examples around this. I think that hydrogen is emerging in, as an emerging technology specifically to be used um, as, as created from renewables in several jurisdictions. Um, I think that there are uh, other jurisdictions in Canada that do allow a wider breadth of possibility of both gray and green hydrogen. Certainly in Alberta, there is a significant gray hydrogen production. But with our decarbonization goals here in Nova Scotia, I think it is really very important to limit that amount of um, production that could come through gray hydrogen, uh, as well as blue hydrogen, as the technologies are not there to um, further that. Thank you. Uh... I believe MLA Burrell has a question. Yeah, thanks. MLA a Burrell. Re a really clear explanation. Thanks. Uh, so this, your first point that the act uh, uh, concerningly may be opening the door to the universe of non-green hydrogen. Uh, would it, in your view, be helpful if the act specified that uh, uh, incentives, uh, um, public resources? Uh, would only uh, could only be directed to uh, green hydrogen. Recognized presenter. Thank you for the question. I think that that could be something that would be helpful, but I think it would be particularly important to uh, know what those incentives may look like, um, and um, including other incentives that could accompany um, coming, things coming back from the process to the province from these facilities um, if hydrogen, depending on how green hydrogen was being used, uh, with, if that is domestically or for export, ensuring that there are in efficient royalties 
something like efficient royalties as well um, if it, the market was being exported. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much for your presentation today. I'll ensure that uh, your submission is given to the proper minister as well. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, so we will pause uh, public hearing on Bill 207 till uh, a little later on in our agenda. We'll move on now to our next item, which is Bill number 203, Labor Standards Code Amended. Uh, we have our first speaker, uh, Elizabeth Cushings, please. Hi, and welcome. Uh, so just to, to remind you, 10 minutes to present and five minutes follow up from uh, members of the committee. And if you could just identify yourself, please, for the record and how you would like to be identified by the committee members, please. Perfect. I guess to start, I'll say good morning, Mr. Chair and the honorable committee members. My name is Elizabeth Cushing, and you can refer to me as Elizabeth. I'm here today to speak as Ruby's mother. I am so proud to be her mom. Ruby was stillborn at 32 weeks gestation. I would like to start by thanking Minister Jill Balzer and her team for all the hard work they have put into this amendment known as Ruby's Law. I would also like to thank my mother, MLA for Coal Harbor Dartmouth, Laura Lee Nickel, for having the courage to speak so openly and publicly about our experience. It is a privilege to be able to influence public policy and not one that I take lightly. One of the greatest gifts to lost parents is to hear people say their child's name. And it has been healing to hear members of this house say Ruby's name. I'd like to also dedicate it to Margot, Mason, Haley, Carter, Ellie, Jack, and all the other babies and their parents whom I have come to know throughout the past few years. It's often said to be the worst club with the best members, and their support has been crucial to my healing. When we found out Ruby died, I remember looking up how to deal with stillbirth, and I'm still not sure how I knew the term because I had never heard anyone speak to it. However, I quickly realized that many people I knew had some personal connection to stillbirth or other form of pregnancy loss. This shouldn't be a surprise as one in four pregnancies end in miscarriage and one in 160 in stillbirth. Further, the number of stillbirths in Canada has remained consistent over the past 20 years. But again, society never speaks of it. Some lost parents are even told by family and friends to try again, move on, or refuse to acknowledge the babies who died. A parent's love is unconditional and it does not depend on whether the baby lives. The emotional pain after the loss of a child is truly indescribable. It is relentless and feels like it will never go away. I remember trying to eat and thinking that it felt pointless if it wasn't to nourish Ruby. I couldn't distract my mind, and the only reprieve I had was when I went to sleep at night. It is a living nightmare. We simply cannot expect people to focus on their work when they are facing such emotional pain and trauma. This amendment is a first step in tackling the stigma that still persists with pregnancy loss and hopefully a beginning in better supporting bereaved parents. However, much more work does need to be done. An unpaid leave is not inclusive. To better support all grieving people, the leave should be paid, and I would also like to see the time frame extended to more than five days. Collaboration with the federal government will be needed, of course, to revise and streamline the EI program, and at the very least, ensure that parents are aware that they can receive parental leave after a pregnancy loss. The work to recognize pregnancy loss and normalize the conversation in society is a long road, but the changes before you today are a good start. My husband, Stephen, and I look forward to continuing to be a part of this conversation. So on behalf of myself, Stephen, Ruby, and all the other lost parents and their children, I once again want to thank Minister Balzer and her team for their hard work and support in moving forward with Ruby's Law. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you so very much for coming forward with your presentation today. And you look a little bit older than, the, I think, 15 years ago when I saw you with your mom, but uh, thanks for taking the time to come. Um, I will ask if there are any questions of uh, committee members, and I'll recognize uh, MLA Lachance, please. Hi, thanks so much for being here this morning. Um, and um, you 
recommended two changes to the current proposed bill. So one was the leap be paid and that the um, length be extended. Um, can you speak a bit more about why paid leave would be important and can you speak a bit more by, about why a, a different length of time would be important and what, what, what would you recommend? I'm sorry, I'll recognize uh, the presenter, please. Through the chair to the member. Yes, as I mentioned, I think having it be a pay leave would make it more inclusive to everyone, like regardless of their circumstances, that they would be able to take the time that they need to grieve. And I also recognize that in regards to your second question, that the amount of time that we need to heal or those initial stages, well, I don't want to say stages, but the initial moments of grief can vary depending on the person. Um, but I would say, in my own personal experience, the grief was probably at its worst for the first month or so. So I'd say two weeks to a month would be an appropriate length of time. Thank you very That's much. question. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, Thank I you. <laughs> um, I know MLA Boudreaux had a question as well. MLA Boudreaux, please. Uh, thank you, Chair, and it's more of a comment than, than a question, but uh, I, you know, I just want to say how, um, how impressed I am that you've come here today to speak to, to your personal experience, and certain, certainly uh, I, I, would, I would say we've all heard from constituents and from people that we know on similar, and, and you know, congratulations again to um, my colleague across the way for uh, presenting this first, and certainly we acknowledge that uh, Minister Balser and, and her team, um, you know, have have listened and uh, have brought this forward. But but just on behalf of uh, from myself and my colleagues, I just want to thank you for for um, putting that um, time in to come in and talk to us today. Thank you. Uh, recognize MLA Burrell, please. Okay. Well, uh, did you? I, have, I'm I sorry. Did you? Have, to, I. I uh, <laughs> I, I did want to say that I, I think, uh, uh, in addition to the, the contribution of the bill itself, uh, I think it's, uh, it's very significant that you've uh, uh, come here to look beyond the bill uh, and to say that this is, this is a step. I think everyone recognizes it's an important step, but that, but that clearly we, we, we need to see uh, to what is required beyond it, and we know that much of that is accomplishable within the provincial realm. So I, I think this is the, the, the bill is, uh, uh, is, is something uh, on which both uh, you and your mother should be complimented, but I, but I think it's particularly important that at this stage of the game we, that you, you haven't come to just say, so this is important, it's good and great, but, say that, but we, need, we need to look past that to what, uh, what people require more and what we can accomplish for them. So I, I think this is very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, MLA. Any further? Thank you so much for coming in and presenting today. Uh, we'll move on now to our second presenter on this bill, Joanne Hussey, please. Good morning and welcome. I'm pretty sure you know the, uh, the rundown, but we'll give you the same as well. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I would ask that you uh, identify yourself uh, for committee members and how you would like them to address you. You'll have 10 minutes to present and five minutes of committee to follow up. Welcome, and I'll turn the floor to you. To the presenter, please. Okay. Great, thanks. Um, my name is Joanne Hussey. I'm a community legal worker at Dalhousie Legal Aid. My pronouns are she, her, and you can refer to me as Ms. Hussey. So I want to thank you for the opportunity to come here today. I think this is a really important and underutilized process that I certainly am working to promote with my students at Dalhousie Legal Aid, so you can expect to see them in the future. Um, Earlier this week on the International Day for the Eradication of Poverty, the Nova Scotia Action Coalition for Community Wellbeing launched a new campaign called Poverty is a Political Choice. And Dalhousie Legal Aid Service is one of the member organizations of that coalition. 
So the coalition is bringing attention to the fact that poverty is legislated into existence through programs, legislative changes, policy that we know are inadequate to bring families and people above the poverty line. So this bill actually provides an important opportunity to correct one of those political choices that do contribute to thousands of Nova Scotians living in poverty. So income security, food security, housing security, and access to supports and services are all impacted by the provision of paid leave for all workers. As the presenter before uh, mentioned, this is an important oversight, I think, in this bill and one that could be easily corrected. Protected leave for employees who experience a pregnancy that does not end in a live birth it is very important. Pregnancies ending in outcomes other than live births have significant impacts, blood loss, surgery, trauma, grief, it's complicated. And it should absolutely be expected that workers in Nova Scotia have their jobs protected while they take that time that they need to recover. However, if the leave is unpaid, then it is really only available to some people and not all people. So if the government chooses to pass this bill without amendments, they will be effectively saying to low-wage workers, to those who struggle to keep up with the rent and the grocery bills, that they are not entitled to the same protections that, as those who can afford to go without five days of pay. Socioeconomic status should not determine your ability to access the protections provided in the Labor Standards Code. However, that is the effect of creating protections that are only available to those who can pay in the form of lost wages. And unfortunately, that is currently the case in Nova Scotia for pregnancy leave, parental leave, bereavement leave, court leave, compassionate care leave, critically ill child care leave, and sick leave, all of which are included in the Labor Standards Code and all of which are unpaid. Low-wage workers make up about a quarter of the workforce in Nova Scotia, so that's about 128,000 people who can seldom afford to take unpaid time off work. So amending this bill to provide protected paid leave for people experiencing pregnancies that do not end in live births has no cost to government. And based on evidence from other jurisdictions that have legislated paid sick leave, legislated paid sick days have little to no effect on overall business costs and in fact are proven to increase retention of workers. More importantly, supporting an amendment to change these from unpaid to paid days demonstrates an understanding that the choices that you make here about the Labor Standards Code have a direct impact on who is falling behind on their rent and who is standing in line at the food bank and who has the warm coat that they need for winter. Thanks. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation and I'll uh, ensure that the appropriate minister has your uh, submission. I'd go to members of the committee for any questions. Uh, MLA Burrell, please. Uh, well, hi, hi. This is, uh, I think this is an important way of um, looking at this bill and this question to say not, not only would uh, paid leave be uh, a nice thing, one of the list of good things the government could someday do, uh, but that in fact not doing it uh, is, as I understand what you're saying, is a, is a form of inequity, is a, is a form of inequality. I think this is a a dimension of this uh, uh, question that uh, maybe hasn't been looked at before. Could you just maybe speak a little to that point, that this is an, an unequal thing to proceed without this provision? Uh, go to the presenter, please. Sure. I think that when we think about the Labor Standards Code, we have to realize that we're setting the, the minimum floor for workers who do not have any other form of protection. So if you are in a higher wage uh, job, you likely already have access to additional benefits. You may be unionized. You may have benefits that far exceed what is in the labor code. So in the labor code, we have to be thinking about uh, what is the basic level of protection that people need. and it's kind of meaningless if uh, those protections are not reasonably accessible for the people who actually need them. Um, if I have to 
essentially pay for access to this leave through lost wages, it means that it's really inaccessible to a large number of people and is effectively meaningless because many people in higher wage positions would already have access to this sort of leave on a paid basis. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? MLA Lachance, please. Hi, thanks so much for coming today. Um, the other presenter talked about the length of leave, and I'm just wondering if you wanted to comment on that. Uh, through to the presenter's mic, please. Absolutely. So I think five days is quite short, given uh, the severity of some of the situations that we can be talking about in this situation. Um, I think that, again, having access to a robust system of paid leave that could include a combination of sick leave um, or longer-term leaves is really, really important. We don't have an adequate number of sick days in the Labor Standards Code. Uh, there's actually fewer sick days provided for in the Labor Standards Code than, than this leave. So I think uh, increasing the number of days generally is really important. Uh, we know that uh, it is still not, sadly, uncommon for women to lose their jobs just for being pregnant. That, could, that is illegal, but not uh, something that doesn't occur. And so to have someone who is suffering from uh, the loss of a pregnancy and to have their employment put in jeopardy because of that is, is truly unfair and definitely an inequity that lower wage workers face in a very different way. Thank you. Uh, MLA Nickel, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your presentation. It certainly came as a, you know, we started this conversation and it was about securing the job and this whole thing of unpaid leave. Obviously, from the reactions I received and saw and read online that no one really knew it was unpaid leave. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to ask you with the Labor Standards Code, if you asked anybody, they all agree that it needs a major upheaval to be, you know, be rewritten. But to that point about it being meaningless to a number of people, what exactly in the labor code would need to be rewritten or adjusted provincially? Because you know there is unemployment insurance, and that's a federal thing. But I just wanted to know specifically, and if you had any data with regards to the number of people it would be meaningless to. Presenter, please. So I don't have a, a number. I do know that people in low-wage work likely wouldn't have access to additional forms of, of benefits or job protections. So like I said, that's about 128,000 people, which is a substantial chunk of people in the province. Um, Really, uh, it comes down to changing the word unpaid to paid. Uh, in other jurisdictions, there is legislated employer paid uh, sick leave, and it doesn't substantially increase cost of business. It substantially increases worker retention. It substantially increases the productivity in the workplace because people are not coming in when they're sick or when they're dealing with complicated family situations that make them probably not very good at their jobs, quite frankly. Um, but when the reality is uh, I can either show up at work today or pay the rent, um, that's not really much of a choice. Thank you. And our last question, MLA Inst, please. Thank you. It's not a question. It's more just a comment. Uh, I'd like to thank both presenters for their foresight, for having a vision that includes more people. Um, we have a, a current climate and time that this move could help some of those who are in need. So thank you so much for bringing this. Thank you, uh, MLA. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. And as I said, I'll ensure that uh, Minister Balzer gets uh, your, your submission. Thank you. Uh, so we are now going to put pause on our presentations for this bill. Uh, we do have presenters, but they're a little later on in the, after, or in the morning, so we'll move to our next bill, 
Moving now to presentations on Bill 198, which is the Emergency 911 Act and Emergency Measures Act. Um, we do have a presenter who is presenting virtually on this one. Do we have our virtual presenter? Okay, if uh, we can bring them on. Hi and welcome. Hello. Uh, welcome very uh, to uh, Law Amendments Committee today. Uh, my name is Brad Johns. I'm chairing the committee. I would, uh, in a minute, just before I turn the floor over to you, I'd like to uh, remind you that you'll have up to 10 minutes to present to the committee and then the committee has up to five minutes to ask following questions. So if you could just uh, identify uh, your name and any organization that you might represent and how you would like to be addressed by committee members, and then I'll start the, uh, the 10 minutes for your presentation. Yes, good morning. Can you hear me okay? We can, thank you, yep. Okay, and can you see me okay? I can't yep. tell that. Okay, so um, honorable chair and members, my name is Ann Kamosi, and I'm here representing myself, although I belong to a number of different disability groups around the province, so I feel that I'm speaking on behalf of many people who have contacted me. Um, you can call me Ann. And I really thank you for the opportunity to speak before the Law Amendments Committee um, especially virtually, since I'm in Antigonish in a wheelchair, and it would have cost me $350 to come to Halifax. Um, and it's very important for people in, with disabilities to be able to present virtually. I'm, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to speak before the Law Amendments Committee with regards to the important legislation being put forward in Bill 198 to amend the Emergency 911 Act. As a disabled senior in a wheelchair who lives alone, I and many other vulnerable persons experienced the terror of no telecommunications during and after the hurricane. I commend the government for enacting legislation to ensure that emergency systems will work both during and after an emergency. However, the only loss of life directly attributable to the hurricane was the loss of an elderly man with dementia who was swept away to sea. This gentleman's life might have been saved by a voluntary vulnerable persons registry, which I will refer to as the VPPR. This view was reiterated by Ontario police and Hampton, New Brunswick EMO officials on CBC radio who said their registries could have proven effective if this gentleman or his family had registered him as vulnerable. Worldwide studies show that people with disabilities are two to, five, two to four times more likely to die in a disaster. 30% of Nova Scotians identify as having some form of disability, including myself, and we have the highest proportion of seniors in Canada, many with family who live afar. That's a lot of vulnerable people in our province. Vulnerable people are not always known to their neighbors as we are often not out and about or people assume that we already have help and we're not visible in the same way that able-bodied individuals are. Additionally, neighbors could not have helped me evacuate safely as I have a heavy electric wheelchair, which by the way, ran out of power um, during the prolonged power outage period. A little known fact is that ambulances will not transfer mobility devices. So I was told by a number of people, just call an ambulance if you need to evacuate. Well, if an ambulance was sent to transport me to a comfort station, I would have no wheelchair. And this rule applies to walkers and folding manual wheelchairs as well. Ambulances have no means to tie mobility devices down. A vulnerable person's registry would not only help identify the most vulnerable people in an emergency, but include them in emergency planning. In my example, a wheelchair van gassed up ready at, in a strategic location would have been part of local planning, not just for me, but for any other individuals with mobility devices, with mobility issues. It's been brought to my attention that separate legislation, Bill 202, has been put forward in the House about the establishment of a voluntary vulnerable persons registry after I spoke about this concept on CBC Radio on September 27th. 
many vulnerable people in this province, caregivers, families, and organizations, including the Canadian military, have contacted me in support of this idea. I applaud Honourable Member Nicol from Dartmouth Coal Harbour, who brought this legislation forward to the House, and to the Honourable Minister McFarland, who supported the idea of a vulnerable persons registry being established in our province. However, I'm here today to suggest that this registry, or the VP, PR belongs in the EMO Act since it would be utilized and administered by EMO officials during emergencies. The registry is not a social service or a housing service or a community service, it's an emergency service and therefore belongs in this Act. Since the EMO Act is already being amended by this committee, it would be efficient to add one simple line to the legislation, and this is the first of my proposed amendments, something to the effect that from here forward, the government will legislate the establishment of a voluntary vulnerable persons registry in all Nova Scotian municipalities to be led and administered by the office and EMO using first voice consultations to develop efficient effective policies and procedures. Once the registry has been legislated, its structure can be developed in consultation with vulnerable persons and EMO officials. And this would allow for flexible community-based systems and approaches suitable for the varying urban and rural situations found in our province. Every community is different. Furthermore, I respectfully suggest that in your amendments, you legislate that telecommunications companies be required to ensure that during and after an emergency, EMO has adequate systems to link the registry to appropriate officials so that they can assist and support the vulnerable persons and or families based on preset protocols that um, really don't have to be legislated in my view, who voluntarily choose to register with EMO officials. The danger of not linking the registry to demands made to telecommunications companies is that the registry exists, but EMO officials can't access the information due to communication failures and disruptions. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to present my views before this committee, especially virtually. I wanna emphasize how important virtual presentation is for many Nova Scotians. And I'd be honored to assist the government further to establish the development of the registry and welcome any questions that the committee may have for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, we do, uh, the members of the committee do have uh, what you submitted in front of us. So I'll uh, ensure that that's forwarded uh, to uh, both the Minister Lore as well as McFarlane. And uh, I know that it's something that we've been discussing at, at, at my, uh, through my department as well. Um, so I may reach out to you in the future and have a chat as well. Um, I will go to uh, committee members if there are any questions of the presenters. There is not. Um, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you for pointing out uh, the benefits of virtual. Um, we, I, I think most uh, members in the House all feel that that virtual presentation opens the door for, for a lot of good, good things. And uh, we, th we thank you for those comments. And uh, as I said, I'll, I'll probably reach out to you myself. Uh, I've been following you on CBC a little bit, so. Uh, so, so. <laughs> I, I, I can't stress to you how many people have contacted me and I'm just an individual. So I think they've really opened up a conversation in the province and, and that conversation was all positive. Yeah. Right. The number of people that reached out and said, I'm alone, I, I want this, how do we get it done? And I'm just an individual, um, but I feel that I have the communication ability to speak on behalf of others, so that's why I'm here today. It's not just for me, it's for, our, for, for all the people in this province who are vulnerable. Well, thank you very much for taking the time today, and we'll see you later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, moving to our next presenter, who I believe is here. Uh, Jerry Post. Nice to see you again. Uh, just before you uh, present, just 
remind you, you have 10 minutes to present to the committee, up to 10 minutes. Uh, the committee then has up to five minutes to ask questions. And if you could please uh, identify yourself, any organizations that you're representing and how you'd like to be referred to by the committee. Well, uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. It's uh, good to be here again. Uh, my name is Jerry Post, and uh, I'm here as an individual. Um, as many of you know, I'm quite active, uh, you know, advocating for the disability community, and uh, that's why I'm here. Um, so, and I, I'd, I'd like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to speak um, uh, on Bill 198, uh, an act to amend the Emergency 111 Act. Uh, I'd also like to echo the proposal put forward by Ann Camosi uh, earlier um, uh, for an amendment that would create a voluntary vulnerable persons registry, which I will refer to as the registry. <laughs> um, I would also like to acknowledge the uh, private member's bill that was introduced uh, by uh, the member from Dartmouth Coal Harbor to establish a registry of vulnerable persons and the positive response it received, uh, including a response from uh, the minister, Carla McFarland, uh, in the legislature, and I have communicated with her as well since then. Um, I think we have support on all sides of the House on this initiative. Most of us have loved ones that would welcome it. 43% of our seniors have at least one form of a disability, and as Anne pointed out, uh, we have the highest percentage of persons uh, that are elderly in, uh, in Canada, and we're getting older. When I became disabled 10 years ago uh, and uh, left hospital, uh, finding an accessible apartment uh, was nearly impossible. I found something that was on the sixth floor of a high-rise tower, um, and once I settled in, the first call I made actually was to the fire department, uh, asking what I should do in case of a fire. And I assumed that there would be a registry. Uh, of course, there wasn't. Uh, I was very concerned about being stuck on the sixth floor because they shut down the elevators during a fire. Of course, there was no registry. And when asked what I should do the, for safety, the answer was move to the first floor. Well, that's, that's easier said than done. Uh, after five years, I now live on the first floor. But that's thanks to the generosity of a friend who was renovating a building and, uh, and accommodated me, uh, and uh, I'm privileged. Most in the disability community are not and struggle to, to, to be able to afford uh, accessible housing. You know, we talk about affordable housing, we quite often seem to forget about that it should be accessible as well. The vision I had for a registry when I called was that in case I had to call 911, my call would be automatically flagged is coming from a vulnerable person in a wheelchair, and that would be passed on to the responders. Or in the case a call came from the building I was in, a large apartment building, that the fire department would be notified that there are vulnerable persons in that building, and these are where they're located. Or in the case of a power outage, like we had during Fiona, that appropriate agencies would be advised of the vulnerable persons in the outage catchment areas. It's a simple thing to do using technology. The registry is there for more than a list. It's a system that links different data sets and technologies from different organizations, along with protocols on what to do under various emergency circumstances and how to deal with different disabilities. Training of first responders would be critical, obviously. And a cocktail of technologies, including com computer mapping and artificial intelligence, can make all of this possible. And nothing works in isolation. Mr. Chairman, uh, as you're aware, your Department of Justice is currently working on an accessible built environment standard. It's important that this standard includes such public safety and emergency features as requirements for evacue chairs in high-rise buildings and flashing alarms for our deaf citizens. The evacue chairs enable us to be able to move downstairs quite easily. I hope what I've outlined is, is, is a dream that, that you share with me as a committee. You or a loved one, one day may need it someday. And the commitment for an accessible Nova Scotia by 2030 is not that far off. And Mr. Chairman, let's have the government take leadership on this and start with the Department of Justice. 
Hospital, the building across the street. I had an office there on the ninth floor, and during fire drills, I used to joke that I should just, that they should just issue me a pill to reduce my suffering in case of fire. So how are they going to get me downstairs in a heavy wheelchair? So they moved me to the third floor, a little closer to the ground floor, but still no, no chairs. Uh, so let's ensure that there is at least one chair for every three floors in that building, not very expensive. And ironically, there is funding available through your government to your landlord to make it happen. But I digress. My recommendations are to amend Bill 198 to 1, enable Nova Scotia to develop and maintain a voluntary vulnerable persons registry, 2, assign EMO with responsibility for the registry, 3, ensure that the planning, design, and implementation of the registry be a collaborative and integrated initiative involving all stakeholders, including first voices from the vulnerable communities. Four, require critical service providers to integrate the registry into their systems, such as the telcos. Five, provide EMO with a one-year deadline to complete the registry design and operational plan along with the budget. In closing, I'd also like to thank the government for reversing its decision on virtual presentations for persons with disabilities. Uh, and it's the only way that Ms. Camozzi was able to exercise her democratic rights. Much more can be done to enrich the legislative process at virtually no cost. So thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. This concludes my presentation, and uh, I'd be willing to take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation, Mr. Post. Uh, any questions of the presenter? Uh, I'll recognize MLA LaChance, please. Thanks so much for being here. I'm wondering if there are examples of these registries in other jurisdictions. Well, there are. Uh, a lot of them are at the local level. Uh, I think, you know, the local oh. I'm sorry, I'll recognize uh, the presenter, please. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Yes, you know, there certainly are uh, around the world, and, uh, and a lot of them are at the local level. I think uh, that's a bit of a mistake in that you get a patchwork of registries, and we have some in the region here as well at the local level. So, uh, so I think, uh, you know, doing an integrated provincial system I think is critical and tie it into the, uh, the EMO infrastructure that's already out there. Thank you. Any further questions? If not, that concludes. Thank you for coming over and presenting, and uh, we'll be in touch. I'll be in touch. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so we are now going to uh, move back. That Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to uh, look for a... Uh, I just wanted to make sure there was not... No, uh, it's kind of all over the place today. Um, so I am going to uh, look for a motion that we close uh, public hearing on Bill 198, Emergency 911 Act and Emergency Management Act, and I'll go to Emily Boudreau. Thank you, thank you, Chair, and I would make the motion to um, that all pre presentations on Bill 203, the Labor Standards Act, uh, or yeah, Labor, sorry, the Emergency 911 Act and Emergency Measure Management Act be closed. Uh, Move to all those in favor, signify with aye. Those opposed, nay. That's carried, and we'll move for another motion, and I'll go back to MLA Boudreau, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that Bill 198, the Emergency 911 Act and Emergency Measure Management Act amended, um, uh, be moved back to the House without further amendment. Uh, we have a motion to move back to the House. All those in favor signify aye. Those opposed, nay. Thank you very much. Uh, and so moving on now back to Bill 203, Labor Standards Code. Um, we, our next speaker on this is at 1030. Uh, we're a few minutes early. Is, uh, is the presenter online? So they're ready to go? Excellent. So uh, we'll bring our next presenter forward then, please.
Hi, how are you today? I'm good. Good. Thanks. We can I hear you. Me. Oh, I was going to say we can hear you and see you. Great. Great. Uh, my name's Brad Johns. I'm the chair. And yeah. uh, just before we uh, get things underway, I would like to remind you uh, that each presenter has 10 minutes, up to 10 minutes, to present to the committee. And committee members have up to five minutes to ask questions. Um, and just before oh, you start... Oh, you've been muted. There we, there we go. go. I'm, I'm unmuted. unmuted. You can, can hear me, hear now? me now? Okay. okay. I think, I think, uh, I think, I think we're going to have to mute you again in a minute because... Of... Okay. okay. There we go. Is that still okay? Okay, I... well, I'll get started, if that's okay. <laughs> she can't hear me. I'm sorry. Any better? Okay, okay, so we're so going to get a few minutes, minutes of feedback, feedback here, here so, so you can, can hear me. Hear me. Um, um, so you, so have, you have 10, 10 minutes to present, to present. five minutes follow-up. Great. So, um, morning, everyone. My name is Kaylee Kennedy, and I'm here speaking as a queer parent and someone who has experienced miscarriage. Um, I'll just let you know that my nine-month-old is running around in the or crawling around at my feet, so I might need to duck down and make sure she doesn't choke on anything or something. Um, so don't worry if I pop down for a second. Um, but I just wanted to speak about a few things that um, concerned me about the bill. Um, and I wanna say that I support measures to expand workers' rights in general, including this new leave. Um, however, I do think that the bill falls short in a few ways. So first, who is eligible for the leave seems unnecessarily restrictive um, and fairly out of touch with our growing acceptance of diverse ways of building families. So for example, under the current legislation in pregnancy losses that occur in the case of pregnancies between people who were not and are not married or in a common law relationship, non-gestational parents are not entitled to the leave. Um, so, you know, in queer communities, it's becoming more and more common to build families with friends co-parenting rather than spouses or partners. But we all know that many people in all walks of life find themselves becoming parents with people who are not their current or former spouse. And this legislation really, in my mind, leaves those people behind. Um, this could be addressed by simplifying the legislation to say that if a pregnancy ends and a person would be the parent of any child resulting from that pregnancy, they are entitled to the leave, kind of regardless of how they're going to become parents if a child were to be born as a result of that pregnancy. While this might seem like a small point, the constant and unnecessary use of biology and marital status to legitimize family families undermines families of like mine that don't necessarily fit into these narratives. So I hope that the committee will consider an amendment to that element. Um, my next two points are more about uh, becoming truly supportive of people who experience an end of pregnancy by not for forcing people to choose between taking the time they need and paying the bills. Um, so this leave should include paid time off. Um, while a lot of focus has been on the emotional impacts of the end of pregnancy, it can also be a very physically demanding and involve multiple appointments. And people shouldn't be having to choose between doing what's required and um, missing out on pay that they need to make ends meet. And the reality is that when leaves are unpaid, many people will still not be able to use the time because uh, they can't afford the hit to their paycheck. Further, I think the committee and the legislature overall should support the introduction of at least 10 paid sick days for all workers. Not everyone wants to talk to their employer about having been pregnant. While it is against the law to discriminate against people who are or might become pregnant in the workplace, the reality is, is that discrimination against pregnant people in employment is still a reality. And for many people that may dissuade them from wanting to take this leave because they'll have to disclose to their employer that they um, were uh, at some time pregnant. A system of paid sick days for all would allow people experiencing pregnancy loss to ex access time off in circumstances where they fear repercussions from employers regarding their pregnancy status. Um, so that's all I have to say. And uh, thanks for your time and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. You can hear me okay now, can you? 
Okay. Uh, so we'll go to uh, questions of uh, members of committee. Are there any questions? Uh, MLA Burrell, please. Uh, uh, yes, thanks for, for this explanation. I, um, I just want to go back to your, your point about how this could be accomplished. Uh, it sounds like you have some pretty specific uh, wording in mind. I wonder, do you have a particular place uh, uh, where this could be inserted, and, and uh, the, you were talking about accomplishing a couple of things with what you were proposing. Would, would that be in the same uh, provision? Yeah, so I think that it could either be a clause at the end, um, so um, that uh, just kind of expands to any, uh, I think the, the, I don't have the legislation in front of me, but I think the legislation, when it refers to surrogacy, says any other person who is pregnant and and where the child would result the child resulting from the pregnancy would be the person would would be a parent resulting from that pregnancy by way of surrogacy that we could include a clause at the end that just takes the first part of that um uh, of that clause and um and just ends it not defining how that person would become a parent so um you know, any other person is pregnant and a child resulting from that pregnancy would have, uh, and the person looking for the leave would have been a parent of the child, any child resulting from that pregnancy. Um, it's also possible that the legislation could be um, expanded by taking out um, in the clause that's about former spouses, taking out biology, and then just um, and then adding that clause as well. So it, I'm not, I'm not going to be prescriptive about what needs to happen, but it, it seems like a pretty simple change to me. Just, we need to say that if someone's pregnant and you would have been a parent to the child that was, uh, that would result from that pregnancy, then you should be entitled to that leave. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Thank you so very, oh, there, there we are. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> uh, thank so thank committee. you very much for your uh, for your presentation today, and and we appreciate you taking the time to do that. Awesome. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye bye. All right. We'll move on to our next presenter on this, who I also believe is virtual. Not here yet. Okay. Is here? Not, not here. Okay. So. Uh, we have them scheduled in at uh, 10.45. Do we have our speaker for Bill 206-207 available right now? Um, I, oh, she, uh, this person would be uh, present. So, uh, Tenyette DeVoe? No? Okay, members, well, maybe we could take a, uh, a five-minute break and, uh, and then come back and see if we have any of our other presenters here. So we'll pause for five minutes.
All right, thank you, uh, members. I will uh, call the committee back to order. And uh, I believe our next presenter, we're continuing on with Bill 203, the Labor Standards Code. Um, and our next presenter, which is a virtual presenter, I believe is online. So we'll uh, go to them, please. Hi, can you hear me okay? I can, can you hear me? We can and we can see you too, so that's great. Um, I'm Brad Johns, I'm the chair of the committee. Thank you for coming forward to present today. Um, I've been reminding all presenters, you have up to 10 minutes to present to the committee and then committee members have up to five minutes to ask, ask questions after that if they'd like. Um, and so I would ask that you just for the record identify uh, your name, any organizations, if any, that you're representing, and how you would like the committee members to address you. And then I'll start sure. your time. Okay. Um, so my name is Lisa Cameron, and I'm here on behalf of the Halifax Workers Action Center. And you can address me as Lisa. All right. Thank you, Lisa. I'll start your time whenever you're ready. Thank you. Um, so yes, as I said, my name is Lisa Cameron and I'm here on behalf of the Halifax Workers Action Center, an employment law focused legal aid clinic that assists low waged and marginalized workers in Nova Scotia. At the Halifax Workers Action Center, we are in daily contact with non unionized workers who interact with and rely upon the basic provincial employment standards. We hear from them directly about the consequences unintended or otherwise of incomplete or inadequate legislative protections. To start, I want to acknowledge that in my opinion, the fact that a conversation is happening in the Nova Scotia legislature about the subject of pre pregnancy loss is positive. Uh, it's such an important subject that does deserve attention. Today, I would like to share my insights gathered through conversations with workers uh, and statistics we've gathered ourselves and acquired elsewhere on how the proposed legislation could be improved so as to ensure the pregnancy loss leave is accessible to those it intends to support and without disruptive consequences for the employee. Like I mentioned, the Halifax Workers Action Center deals with workers who rely on the basic employment standards, and this is because their contracts do not, or perhaps barely exceed them. So this demographic would therefore account for those that would be most likely to use this leave. However, these workers are also earning well below a livable wage in Nova Scotia, far below. Nearly 40% of the workers in contact with us this past year were earning $30,000 a year or less, when the cost of living in Halifax, for example, roughly equals about $50,000. For anyone, a pregnancy loss can be devastating. For a low-wage worker in Nova Scotia, however, the unpaid leave entitlement would mean that many would have to choose between a work of wages and the time they need to recover. We already learned in COVID that low-wage workers are likely to forfeit unpaid leave and instead go to work because the loss of income is unmanageable. And this is really unsurprising when we look at the exorbitant and rising cost of food, housing, childcare, and other basic necessities in Nova Scotia. Uh, we assume that unpaid pregnancy loss leave will be, or sorry, we assume that unpaid pregnancy loss leave will be no different. Um, secondly, in order for an employee to take the leave and for the employer to approve the leave, the employee would be forced to reveal their pregnancy loss to their employer in some way or another. We at the Halifax Workers Action Center are aware, well aware that this comes with major risks to the employee. Uh, termination following an employee disclosing a pregnancy or an intention to become pregnant to an employer uh, or an employer otherwise learning that the employee is pregnant or desires to become pregnant, for example, is a concern that we often hear at the Halifax Workers Action Center. Um, in one case, a worker disclosed her desire to become pregnant to a coworker a male manager overheard the conversation and she was fired after three years of stable employment almost immediately. Busy parents, particularly mothers, have been historically viewed as a burden on workplace productivity. When a worker is forced to disclose something intimate that the employer has, uh, or the employer has uh, information, that may motivate them to take action against the individual to protect them, their bottom line. And that is dangerous and can lead to uh, very discriminatory outcomes. Um, some of our top complaints that we hear include wrongful dismissal, disability discrimination, and gender discrimination. Pregnancy loss leave, if not handled with enormous care, could force workers to interact with all of those legal dimensions. 
Before I end, I wanted to share that it was a pregnancy loss and the way in which it was handled by my employer that caused me to join the labor movement five years ago. During a super difficult personal time, I submitted a medical note to request time off in order to attend um, and recover from a painful surgery. My employer agreed to the time off as it was their legal duty to accommodate me. However, they had uh, other ways to make things very difficult and that included having five male managers hound me for what ultimately became four different medical notes, each with increasing personal detail, all to substantiate a very brief workplace absence. And it almost forced me to disclose the nature of my issue, something that, I, that they had no right to know. Luckily, I had a doctor who was a, a good advocate. Um, many people don't. In Ontario, where I worked at the time, likewise with Nova Scotia, uh, there remains no limits in Nova Scotia on an employer's ability to request medical documentation of employees who need unpaid medically prescribed time off. So to finish, I would like to state that it is the opinion of the Halifax Workers Action Center that the best way to allow working people to recover from pregnancy loss would be to legislate instead 10 permanent employer paid sick days, as well as impose limitations on an employer's ability to request medical documentation of employees seeking short term work absences. This way, the employee is not forced to disclose a pregnancy loss to an employer. Otherwise, this raises massive concerns about privacy. The employer is not tempted to discriminate against the individual, and therefore, the employee is not left to seek legal remedies retroactively, which is a process that we here understand uh, to be very burdensome. The employee is not forced to choose between wages and recovery. And the already burdened healthcare system is not overrun with medical note requests, which really have no other purpose than to satisfy an employer's administrative need, and which we know for a fact can be used punitively. And despite what you may think, employers benefit from this too. Workplaces function best when employees are cared for, and this is something that we know. We also know that workers do not abuse time, uh, paid time off leave uh, that they are entitled to. Evidence from jurisdictions where they did legislate paid sick leave shows that sick leave is rarely abused. In fact, employees tend to take fewer than what they are legally entitled to. For example, when San Francisco mandated nine paid sick days, the average worker used only three of them. A quarter used zero. When New York City mandated paid sick days, a survey of employers found that 98% reported no known cases of abuse. Workers treat paid sick leave like insurance only to be used when it's needed. And while there's no evidence that workers widely abuse paid sick days, there is extensive proof that paid sick leave benefits individuals as well as their families, their workplaces, and their communities. Uh, thank you. Thank you so very much uh, for your presentation and taking the time today. I'd like to ask if there are any, any members of the committee that have any questions. Uh, MLA Burrell, please. Uh, well, well, thanks for uh, the different angles that you've come at this from. And I, I, uh, I want to ask you about one in particular uh, to make sure that we understand it. And that's the point about uh, non-necessary, not necessarily a disclosure. Uh, so c can you explain a little bit about uh, uh, how this might work in practice, what, what that really means. When an employee is forced to disclose a pregnancy loss? Yeah. In to an employer? To, in order to avail the leave. Yes. Um, so, like I said, the this, this was actually when I started at the Workers' Action Center, um, one of the top complaints that we were hearing. So, when a worker disclosed to an employer that they were pregnant, perhaps because they were starting to show that they were pregnant or because they needed medical appointments or you know, they anticipated being uh, needing time off in the future maternity leave. Um, I was hearing from a number of people uh, that they were actually losing their jobs almost immediately. And the employer you know, can be intelligent about it. They won't say explicitly that that's the reason. But when you look at an employee who has a very clean track record of employment, no, you know, no, it, no major issues with employment, it's been going well. Um, and then all of a sudden, the employer says, you know, you've been late five minutes or whatever, and now we're going to have to fire you. It's pretty obvious what's actually happening. The employer does not want to deal with inconsistent workflow. They don't want to deal with interruptions. It's not beneficial to their bottom line. And so they, uh, they let the employee go for a reason which is, is basically made up just to allow them to, to get rid of pregnant workers. Um, so in this case, when you're dealing with pregnancy loss, I'm anticipating that you'd have people who may be trying to become pregnant, 
who are like, you know, basically forced to explain, oh, this is my this is my future plan with my family. I want to become pregnant. I lost a pregnancy. Um, please allow me this time off. Well, then the employer is able to gather information that, frankly, they should not be entitled to about uh, that person's uh, intentions as far as pregnancy, as far as their bodies go. And obviously, this will disproportionately impact people based on gender as well. Thank you very much. Any further questions? Thank you so very much for your time today and taking the, uh, the time to come to present to us. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Okay, that concludes our presenters on Bill 203, Labor Standards Code. I would look for a motion to close the public hearing on this. Uh, go to MLA Boudreaux, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I now move that um, presentations on Bill number 203, Labor Standards Code amended, now be concluded. Uh, all those in favor, signify aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. Do we have a motion on this bill? Uh, MLA Boudreaux. Thank you, Chair. I move that bill number 203, Labor Standards Code amended, be reported back to the House uh, without further amendment. We have a motion on the floor. All those in favor, aye. aye. Those opposed? We'll move that back. Thank you, members. And we'll revert back now to uh, bill 207, I think it was. Uh, so, uh, so we have, uh, a pr is our presenter for this one online? Not, or I'm sorry, is uh, our presenter for this one would be here? Uh, Tenyette DeVoe? Okay. Um, just before we do that, uh, I believe you were going, you can come on up to the mic. I believe you were going to present on, uh, on Bill 207, the Electricity Act, and you wanted to also present on 206, Underground Hyben Carbon Storage Act. Okay, so uh, what we'll do is we'll let you start off. I, I think uh, Ledge Council had said we were gonna try to get you in for both because of timing. Um, we'll give you a little bit extra time because we are running a, a few minutes earlier, so if you wanna, uh, instead of the, the 10 minutes to present on the two, uh, I'll give you 15 to present on the two of them and then follow up five minutes up to 15 minutes on the two of them and then uh, follow up questions from uh, members. You can do one and pause or you can do both at the same time. Uh, yeah. Both at the same time. Okay. okay. Um, yeah. So what I'll do is I'll just ask you to identify uh, for the members uh, your name. Mm -hmm. uh, if you are representing any uh, groups or interest groups or anything, if you could identify that as well. And also how you'd like to be addressed by committee members. And then I'll turn the floor over to you. All right, thank you. So my name is Tinette DeVoe, and I am here representing uh, the Sierra Club of Canada. And uh, I go by she, her. So, um, Minister Tory Rushton says that the amendments to the Electricity Act, Underground Hydro Hydrocarbon Storage Act, the Pipeline Act, and the Gas Distribution Act are intended to pave the way for green hydrogen. He and his colleagues say that Nova Scotia is well positioned to become a world leader in green hydrogen production and export. Unfortunately, it is clear to me from reading the transcript of the comments made in the House on Tuesday that Mr. Rushton and his colleagues actually know very little about green hydrogen. The information they've shared to date is what you'd find in a prospect sheet written by hydrogen startup companies looking for investors. So I'd like to share what the scientific community and renewable energy experts tell us about green hydrogen. Green hydrogen only makes sense as a byproduct of renewable energy generated 
for electricity. This means that clean, renewable wind and solar energy should supply electricity first, and any ex excess wind supply, for example, can be used to produce green hydrogen. So why? Well, because you lose energy every step along the way as you turn renewable energy into hydrogen and then ammonia so that it can be transported. The government is planning to offer leases for five gigawatts of offshore wind. If that wind energy were used to power Nova Scotia's grid, the province could get off coal and other fossil fuels. Our peak load is plus or minus 2.2 gigawatts in the province. The average load is just under one gigawatt to about 1.6 gigawatts. The, our in-province generation is currently 2.45 gigawatts. So a reminder that the offshore leases that we're talking about here are for five gigawatts. That is double our in-province generation capacity. So imagine we could actually get off expensive and dirty imported coal as well as oil and gas if we were to develop offshore wind for domestic use rather than green hydrogen for export. Excess offshore wind energy could then be harnessed for green hydrogen production. So I'm going to comment on one argument that, that comes up, um, and that is, well, what about Germany and other European countries that are struggling to power their grids and heat their homes right now because of um, the situation with Russia and Ukraine? So, um, first of all, using green hydrogen for heating is extremely inefficient. If green hydrogen is used for heating, it has an energy efficiency of 46%. So what does that mean? It means that for every 100 kilowatt of renewable energy used to produce green hydrogen, only 46 kilowatt hours of heat is produced because of energy losses in production, storage, and transportation of that gas. Heat pumps, on the other hand, produce an energy efficiency of 270%. Now, that kind of doesn't uh, intuitively make sense, but what it means is that for every 100 kilowatt hours of renewable energy, 270 kilowatt hours of heat is produced by heat pumps. So if we genuinely want to help Germany and other European countries get through the winter without Russian gas, we should be building a heat pump factory, not developing offshore wind, uh, which will take a number of years, and factories to uh, process this wind energy into hydrogen that then needs to be converted to ammonia that then needs to be shipped to Europe and will be an inefficient use of that renewable energy. There are some uses of green hydrogen that make sense, for example, for heavy industry, that requiring high temperature heat, such as steel making and cement production, aviation and long distance transportation, particularly shipping. But those are very specific and they um, don't mitigate the enormous need we have here in Nova Scotia to clean our grid. 
Um, the, the other issue that I want to raise is that green hydrogen actually does have an environmental impact. Um, a lot of fresh water is required to produce green hydrogen. Um, it has to be pure water, can't be salt water. And um, the Earth's fresh water is only 2.5% of all water. The rest is ocean water. So, you know, I was watching the news a couple of nights ago, hearing about the, um, the water rationing in parts of BC right now. Um, we are getting to the point where fresh water, even in Canada, is, you know, should be treated as a very precious resource and not one to be, uh, you know, taken lightly and used for heavy industry. Um, whether it's making hydrogen or coal, or yeah, coal mining or gold mining, uh, we this is what uh, it has value right now is water. We should not squander it. Um, I also take issue with um, the idea that somehow this green hydrogen initiative is going to produce a lot of economic benefits. Um, it goes by the trickle-down uh, theory of economics, which I think most uh, regular folks in this province know isn't working so well. Um, and so if government subsidies are going to be going towards uh, this offshore uh, wind production, uh, that's my taxpayers' dollars, your taxpayers' dollars, and I think we deserve um, an informed say about how that's going to be used. Um, I will also point out that Mr. Rushton uh, seems to believe that we're going to begin the industry with onshore wind when, in fact, if he's referring to the project in Canso, um, it will actually be coal, not onshore wind. Um, and I'll share an article after this by Joan Baxter, which explains the plan. So in the bill that you've introduced, um, you have terminology like blended hydrogen. Blended means some color other than green. Uh, which means relying on fossil fuels once again. Um, we have what um, one MLA referred to uh, the other day in the House. Um, she said, Nova Scotia is the would-be Saudi Arabia of offshore wind, of the offshore wind world. Uh, that was Danielle Barkhouse who said that in the um, comments, and, um, oh, it's in the transcript, um, the Hansard. What's that? Oh, was it? Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll check the transcript to make sure they didn't confuse you there, too. But, um, so we have this enormous resource. Yes, we should use it. But let's use it for the right reasons. Let's get Nova Scotia off coal and fossil fuels. That will help Europe uh, because we won't be competing for coal and oil imports as we are now. Um, I know it's so tempting to want to think that this is the, the silver bullet, that finally we will have our our day in the sun once again, and we'll be world leaders in this and that. Um, but as uh, leading hydrogen experts will tell you, that's, um, that's bubble speak. Um, this, you're in a bubble that is, make, doesn't make sense. Um, this expert who spoke at the uh, World Hydrogen Conference uh, explained that it's like 
you know, yes, a Swiss Army knife can do lots of things. You could pick your teeth with it, he said. You could cut your hair, but you won't because it doesn't make sense to use those things. So if you want to use green hydrogen, use it as a byproduct that's created from um, excess wind energy. We have hydro, which is dispatchable, that can uh, balance the grid. And, um, you know, let's uh, show the rest of Canada and the world that, yeah, we are leaders in wind and we know how to use it. Those are my comments. Thanks. Thank you very much. And I let the clock keep going. So you did go over the 10, but that's okay. You didn't go over the 15. So if I did give you an extra, you took an extra too. So, um, uh, so I will go to members of the committee and ask if there's any questions. Okay. Did, do you actually have a copy of your presentation of your notes? Or? You know, I will send one in, but I only found out yesterday afternoon that this meeting was happening. Okay. Uh, and uh, I would love to uh, submit, you know, more detailed, and I'll give you the, the citations and so on. Okay. Yeah. Well, if you could do that to uh, uh, Legislative Council, and uh, they'll distribute it to members. And thank you very much for coming today. All right. Thank Great, you. Thank you. Um, so with that, that would be our final presenter. So I'm looking uh, for a motion that we close the public hearing on both uh, bill. We'll do the first one, Bill 207, the Electricity Act. And I'll go to MLA Boudreau. Thank you, Chair. I, I make a motion that um, presentations on Bill 207, the Electricity Act, now be concluded. Uh, all those in favor, aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. Okay. Um, and I'll look for a motion in regards to 207. Uh, motion on the floor, all those in favor? Those opposed? Okay, so I'm also going to look, because that was a kind of a joint one, I'm also going to look for a motion to close public hearing on 206 Underground Hyphen Carbon Storage Act, please. And I'll go to MLA Boudreau for that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would make a motion that presentations on Bill 206, the Underground Hydrocarbon Storage Act, now be concluded. Uh, motion, all those in favor, aye. Those opposed, nay. And a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yep, I'm sorry, uh, MLA Boudreau. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that bill number 206, the Underground Hydrocarbon Storage Act, be reported back to the House without further amendment. Uh, those in favor, aye. Those opposed, nay. That one's carried just before members leave. I want to extend to the members that uh, were here today to the meeting. Thank you very much. I think we had a very productive meeting today, and, and I thank everybody for decorum and how things went. I think we had a good meeting. I also uh, quickly want to thank uh, the members of Ledge TV who are back there, uh, continuing to uh, offer support in regards to our online. Uh, works well, and uh, I really appreciate uh, their commitments as well. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. We'll see you when the house goes in. <laughs>